It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Manish Gupta, today's speaker for the Samvad. Dr. Manish Gupta is the Infosys Foundation Chair Professor at IIIT Bangalore and a co-founder and CEO of VideoKen, a video technology startup. Previously, Manish held um, several positions, uh, um, including uh, as Vice President and Director of um, Xerox Research Center India, and has held various leadership posi positions with IBM, including that of Director, IBM Research India, and Chief Technologist, IBM India, South Asia. As a Senior Manager at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, New York, Manish led a team uh, developing the system software for the Blue Gene uh, supercomputer. IBM was awarded a National Medal of Technology and Innovation for Blue Gene by the US President Barack Obama in 2009. Manish holds the PhD in Computer Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He has co-authored about 75 papers with more than 6,000 citations in Google, Google Scholar and an H-Index of 45 and has been granted 19 US patents. While at IBM, Manish received two Outstanding Technical Achievement Awards, an Outstanding Innovation Award, and the Lou Gesner Team Award for Client Excellence. Manish is an ACM Fellow, a Fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering, and a recipient of a Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIIT Delhi, and more recently has been elected into the ACM India Council as well. We are very honored to have you with Triple ITP Manish. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Arsi. So, uh, so I'll today talk about uh, applying machine learning to support human learning. Um, so, I'll start with a problem statement. Um, then, uh, apologize if it comes across as too commercial, but that's the reality. Um, I'm focusing a lot of my energies on on trying to, uh, along with my team. Uh, developing a platform called VideoCan to try and uh, uh, help with the whole uh, uh, utilization of online video resources. Uh, then I'll describe some of the technical details behind the platform as well as some open research problems, some of which we have started working on uh, over here at the institute uh, with students as well as there are other team members at VideoCan who are working on some of these problems. And finally, uh, conclude. So, uh, so I don't need to tell this crowd, right, how technology is really changing the face of the world around us. Uh, there are uh, things like self-driving cars, uh, which are beginning to appear in some parts of the world. Uh, we've already seen uh, factory floors go through, again, a, a major transformation. Today, if you go to a car factory, you'll find very few humans around. Uh, they've been mostly replaced by robots. And if you look at, again, the Indian IT services industry, um, they really built a very, very large business uh, by doing various kinds of, uh, offering various kinds of services to customers all over the world, right? They started providing initially things like uh, BPO services, uh, where there would be um, their own agents who would be handling the customer queries from their client's side. Uh, then they got into a lot of IT infrastructure outsourcing, where there would be servers and storage systems uh, for their clients, which are being completely managed by them. Uh, now, traditionally, a lot of that has been done by humans, for which the IT services industry was always hiring armies of people. Every year, they would go and hire uh, a typical company like Infosys, TCS, and so on, might go and hire some 40 to 50,000 people. Uh, uh, and they were being uh, essentially uh, uh, hired uh, to perform a variety of these, plus as well as application development services. Now, what you are beginning to see now is also automation uh, happening in that uh, services area. Uh, the current buzzword for that is robotic process automation. Uh, and essentially what it is doing is it is taking some of these technologies which have started to appear in the consumer domain. Um, so we have seen this Amazon Echo speaker uh, which interacts with, uh, with, with people in natural language uh, and it will do certain tasks for you. Uh, we have seen the Cortana engine from Microsoft. Earlier there was this IBM Watson system which beat the human champions in the game of Jeopardy. Uh, 
it was able to understand these questions that were posed in natural language and from its database uh, of knowledge uh, that it had built uh, by reading all kinds of doing the equivalent of reading all kinds of encyclopedias and so on it was able to answer uh, these questions better than the human champions in the history of the game so so now what these services companies are doing is taking some of these technologies and applying them in the enterprise context so so for instance now to to be able to uh, deal with that customer service problem you first need to understand that quest customer's query and then uh, rely on the knowledge base that you might have built of various potential problems and solutions and so on to try and answer these so all of this transformation uh, that we see has very serious implications for uh, learning in particular so one major implication is that students need to pick up new skills i mean earlier what was happening in india is a lot of our students who were graduating with an engineering degree uh, i'm oversimplifying a little bit but many of them were not really acquiring too many skills uh, during their four year program uh, because of the poor quality of education uh, and at the end of four years uh, these companies would go and pick up these students Uh, and then say okay now we really need to give them the right skills so that they are able to handle all of our client engagements and then they would put them through a kind of a finishing school uh, train them on programming communication skills and so on uh, essentially take them through maybe three depending on the company three months or six months of training and then put them on the project uh, so so essentially uh, this short period of training was now enough with programming kind of skills being provided during that training was enough to get the students to be able to do the job uh, on these uh, paid projects from the clients now that's not going to be the case anymore because now if you think about these very simple tasks if you needed to simply write a simple script to kind of figure out which server is down or uh, or if again non engineering graduates being were being recruited for bpo services simply answer a, a customer query these did not require very very sophisticated skill but now if your job is to try and automate some of these processes um, through a combination of again natural language processing all these uh, knowledge graph techniques and so on now this is much more non trivial work and it requires a much deeper Uh, understanding of things like machine learning and artificial intelligence and likewise i mean there are other technologies uh, blockchain is becoming very very popular uh, both in the supply chain uh, industry as well as financial in uh, in the financial services world uh, there's a potential to kind of transform those uh, using these cryptocurrencies and so on so 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 now uh given that the it companies services companies are not really asking these people for the most part to do very mundane tasks uh which is actually a good good thing uh, they want much more complex things to be done uh they the students need much deeper skill and likewise uh, all these it companies are also trying to figure out what to do with their existing set of employees so they need to be retrained and there are some estimates that by 2030 about a billion people will need to be retrained uh and meanwhile the learning methodology itself is going through a uh, major digital transformation that there's uh, a move from simply classroom based learning to online and blended learning and much more emphasis on uh, self driven learning above all i would say uh, this is something which has become critically important uh, one of the things that we must in some sense teach our students uh because sometimes schools and colleges i've seen that discussion even amongst high school teachers what are those skills we should impart to our students so that they are able to do the jobs 15 years from now uh, what would be the skills relevant 15 years from now uh and and often i mean whenever again uh, at least i have a voice i would say look the primary thing that you need to teach the students is learning how to learn as long as they are enthusiastic and able to learn they will pick up whatever skill it's much harder to predict what exactly will be the skills that would be important and relevant 15 years from now it's much easier to just make people get into the habit 
of learning and getting them the necessary skills. So with all of these, I think it becomes extremely important that we in the educational institutions also start changing how we impart because I think it is, it is important for us to also start to expose our students to these methodologies which will carry them through after they are no longer at an institution like ours because uh, when they go into the into let's say the real world start taking up a job and so on it is going to be extremely important for them to continue their learning and they must not rely on this process that of classroom teaching as the primary uh, way in which they pick up new skills i think it is very important for us to expose students right from this stage to these more modern methodologies which will carry over more easily when they are working so this work that i'll present it actually started as a research project uh, when i was at xerox um, i asked the following question i kind of pushed my team to take up this this work because i was very passionate about learning as which i viewed as our number one problem as a country and the more i see of how broken our system is the more i get convinced yes it is actually uh, an extremely important and urgent problem for us to tackle uh, so i asked the following question there are so many high quality videos which are freely available today um, and we as individuals often make use of them that's why they exist otherwise i mean uh, nobody would have created all these videos but why aren't we taking advantage of these in an institutionalized manner right so i mean it started with this uh, the whole trend to the best of my knowledge got started with mit uh, open courseware where mit despite being the top university or one might say because they are the one, number one university uh, they they weren't thinking of how do i protect my my asset uh, my important asset all of this wonderful knowledge uh, in my teacher in our teachers uh, how how we teach and so on they said let's expose it to the rest of the world and then came things like khan academy uh, edx coursera udacity and so on uh, and the nptel initiative uh, from the government of india so there are millions of uh, videos which are now freely available today and we ask the question are we really utilizing them in a formal manner for learning either in educational institutions or in companies so it turns out that companies also spend about 100 billion dollars per annum today uh, on training their employees and the answer was no that most companies most institutions are not taking advantage of all of these videos so then we ask the question why not uh, because there must be good reasons, right? Uh, uh, and these were some of the reasons we uncovered. One reason was that it's overwhelming. The stuff on the web is overwhelming. And this is particularly true for companies as we talk to the companies. They say, look, there is a lot of high quality content we know, but there's also so much junk. And it's a big problem, right? For us to now to have to separate the high quality stuff from all of this low quality material that's also out there so so that's the reason right we don't even take advantage and in fact many of our uh, customers some of the customers who have deployed our solution in fact uh, and this is very typical for many many companies they in fact don't allow the use of youtube uh, inside the company network so so companies like pcs wipro and so on you cannot at least during daytime i mean there are different degrees TCS doesn't allow it at all. Wipro allows maybe outside the office hours you are uh, allowed to uh, watch those videos. And so one of the reasons is look, in addition to kind of all of this good quality material and they realize there is good quality material. There's also so much of uh, other stuff. And so they would like to avoid the distraction and using up the company network. The other uh, reason uh, companies say and likewise uh, institutions would also say is that we need an easy way to incorporate just what we want so so my kind of uh, view of for instance the government of india is now trying to promote after all of this wonderful content has been created with nptel and now there is this whole swayam portal that has been launched uh, so government is really very actively pushing various educational institutions to start allowing uh, 
some of these some credits to be taken by the students through these online courses uh, while it is kind of a reasonable move I think uh, I would say in the right direction to me one major issue with asking somebody to simply allow students to take MOOCs in a university setting is that the in some sense the role of the teacher the local instructor the teacher professor they are getting disintermediated because uh, let's say if I am running a course on programming languages and for that I say okay I'm going to whatever uh, let's say tell the students okay you can follow this particular MOOC that has been created on programming languages by whatever uh, a certain institution now the natural question at least uh, is is there also a local teacher who should be involved or is there nobody involved if there's a local teacher who's involved what exactly is the local teachers role in that case uh, if they are are they simply kind of watching the students take those MOOCs and sitting kind of uh, and just maybe often because these MOOCs would also have assessments or do they maybe don't give any of the lectures they only do the assessment so what exactly is the role right and uh, uh, so that that would be kind of a big big issue with the adoption of MOOC uh, let's say in an educational institution in a company uh, the often uh, the companies have a very specific let's say a particular group has a very specific business problem in mind so often they are not interested uh, and they don't have the time to kind of go through an entire course uh, they just want to know what what is enough for them to solve that business problem so whatever that material has to be kind of uh, in some sense personalized to the needs and this problem for instance uh, was posed to me by the previous Infosys CTO now a lot of those people are gone um, he asked the following question he said no it's not just a matter of he said let's let's say I have an engineer who's working on spam detection in email um, I don't want to give him just general gyan on machine learning I want to feed that engineer with the spell with what uh, uh, material they need to be able to solve that problem right so it's not just the general course they want to be able to and this is also now known as bite-sized learning and kind of there's a move to encourage people to engage in continuous learning uh, instead of enrolling in a course within a company the other thing is uh, this is my own terminology that videos tend to be very opaque so unlike text where you look at a text and visually very very quickly kind of see what's going on uh, in the text videos tend to be kind of these opaque objects that you can't peer inside what's inside the video if it's a one hour video uh, unless you start playing that one hour video you don't get a view of what is inside that one hour video whereas text um, often you can very quickly kind of take a look and if you look at things like textbooks textbooks always come with a table of content I mean they come with a glossary a table of contents and so on whereas videos don't uh, the other issue is one of engagement uh, so I've been doing this survey when I go and visit colleges I often ask uh, the audience uh, how many of you prefer watching videos to reading textbooks uh, now this audience has too many professors but uh, maybe I should ask the question here how many of you prefer watching videos to reading textbooks so what you'll find is all the professors including me our hands will remain down and the students the young people in the audience usually all hands go up amongst the students uh, and I've seen that with my my kids my kids it's very hard to get them to read a textbook uh, even for the even the prescribed textbooks they somehow just prefer watching videos to learn anything uh, then I often ask the follow-up question okay you like watching videos uh, how long can you watch your favorite movie or that soccer game or cricket match and so on right without before you start getting distracted what's the answer typical answer typical time let them answer let the uh, millennials or the young students answer I'll come back to you two hours three hours right so how long can you watch 
let's say there's a topic which is of interest to you. Let's say machine learning, right? It's hot these days, AI. Everybody wants to pick up. How long can you watch a video lecture on AI or machine learning without, you, without getting distracted? Right. What's the typical time you can watch? 10 minutes? Yeah. So usually the first answer I get is half an hour. And half an hour, it turns out either that person is a geek or they are kind of exaggerating. Because when you really question them, then the real answers start coming out, right? And the real answers usually vary from 10 minutes to 5 minutes for some people. And for some people, it's 2 minutes, right? After 2, 5, 10 minutes, we start getting distracted. Uh, so, so this combination, right? So I mean, now people are increasingly beginning to use videos for learning, especially the new generation. Forget about us. Uh, the new generation, they are really using videos for their learning and they get disengaged very quickly. So one of the questions I've always raised and uh, nobody has kind of, uh, I've often asked, is there something about the sh show business, right? That these people have somehow figured out how to make videos very engaging and they are able to keep people's attention uh, with maybe all kinds of dramatic uh, background music and this, that and so on. Is there something we can learn from showbiz to make our videos as engaging? So I've often asked that question and so far at least most professors have told me, no, I don't think it's really feasible. Uh, the reality seems to be that when it comes to learning, we have to accept that most people will have a relatively short attention span. Now, what happens is a lot of, let's say, if you look at many of these sources, if you look at, let's say, MIT Open Course Pair, or if you look at NPTEL, many of these are classroom recordings of lectures. So these are all one hour long. And, and basically, that's one of the reasons we found that nobody has the, I mean, students don't have the patience to go and watch a one hour uh, lecture, right? So we need uh, a way to deal with these issues. So, so that led to, again, us trying to see, could these be addressed to some degree through a technology-based platform, right? So video can then was our attempt to start building such a platform uh, that can help deal with some of these issues. So what it does is it basically lets you uh, utilize any of these freely available educational resources. Uh, this could be of any form but including videos. So, I mean, these could be PowerPoint presentations, URLs, PDFs, and so on. But in particular, we do some special things for videos and allow the, whatever, let's say the company utilizing our platform or the educational institution utilizing our platform to be able to utilize that material for, again, the various learning programs for, for their target audience. Uh, so, so, let me, instead of kind of going through all of these uh, kind of text on this, let me show what are some of the things that we support. The first thing that we supported, which was to deal with this problem of overwhelming. The content is overwhelming. The first thing we provide is a search engine that given any topic that you're interested in, and this was also uh, kind of one of the inputs that we received when we did. So we actually started uh, with a ethnography study uh, when we were at Xerox um, to try and understand uh, what are, what's going on with some of the uh, teachers and so on. So, so they told us, yes, they are aware of NPTEL, but they also told us that, look, we have a certain syllabus that's prescribed by the university. So first and foremost, and often we, we don't have a very good idea of what lectures in the NPTEL content, right, might be covering the material. Uh, so, so we give a search engine. Uh, which is integrated with all of YouTube by default, and it can be integrated with additional sources, and it gives you search results. Uh, the other part is of opaqueness, which I was mentioning. Uh, it, what it does is we automatically analyze the contents of the video, and this is where some of the machine learning comes in. So we are applying machine learning, and I'll talk about some of those techniques, uh, to analyze the contents of the video, to come up with a few indices. And these indices were inspired by textbooks, what we see in textbooks. So the first index, this 
what we call phrase cloud, is inspired by the glossary in a textbook. That uh, similar to a glossary, it automatically identifies the key phrases that are showing up in the video, as well as the places in the video where those, just like a glossary also says, okay, this term appears on page number such and such. Uh, we also, we, the equivalent of that is we show you exactly where in the video those terms appear. The other thing is the table of contents. So we automatically try to infer what are the different topics which are being covered uh, in the video. And right now, uh, at least for us as a company, uh, and again, and this is, uh, we are still in that journey. So Phrase Cloud today, uh, so earlier when we started, let's say last year, uh, we would find reasonable kind of phrases coming up, but often there were also a lot of irrelevant phrases that people would say, fine, I mean, uh, so we've recently done a lot of, again, applied a fair amount of machine learning to finally improve the quality. So at this point, if, if you, for instance, look at Video Ken, uh, my claim is you will find fairly relevant phrases, which are kind of key things, key concepts, which are being covered in the video. Uh, of course, there are always kind of errors either way, but at this point, it has gotten fairly good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Right now, this relevance is only different by the content of the video. Uh, I'll come back to user interactions and how we take advantage of user interactions, but that's more for recommendations uh, where we will try to take advantage. This is purely based on the analysis of the content and more specifically phrase cloud today is based on purely the audio content of the video. So what we do is we first convert all of the audio content from speech to text and then we apply natural language processing and again there we have applied a fair number of all these TFIDF and so on various techniques uh, including so right now uh, the techniques that have really ultimately helped us improve uh, the effectiveness of the phrase cloud, we are heavily utilizing external sources like Wikipedia. So whenever we find an entry in Wikipedia for a particular phrase, we kind of start giving uh, preference to these kinds of uh, things because hopefully that, that is an important phrase. Uh, uh, and, and there are other things that we do uh, to try and take out irrelevant phrases. This table of contents is a very, very hard problem. So finally, as of maybe about a month or two months ago, we finally got to a point where when you have slide-based lectures, so let's say if this lecture is getting recorded and I'm using slides, so if primarily kind of we make the assumption that if a lecture is using slides, then most of the topics in that lecture are covered by slides and we make a further simplifying assumption that any change of topic will happen at a slide boundary. So then it boils down to the problem of trying to identify those video frames which contain slides and then identifying the, doing the optical character recognition, right? So let's say if this was the lecture which Video Ken was analyzing, it will identify, okay, here's the uh, frame and then it will do all this OCR over all this text and then it will try to infer that, oh, this video indexing table of content this looks like the title and it will try to come up with that as the title of this uh, section. Uh, uh, so, uh, so at this point, we find that when you have slide based videos, we get a reasonably good um, table of contents for those videos. Otherwise, table of content doesn't work very well. So what we have now done is we also, and in fact, Unkar has really uh, done all of that work, who's here, uh, one of the alums of uh, IIIT and one of our best employees, uh, I might say. Uh, he's been uh, building this tool through which uh, you can kind of either edit any of these uh, table of contents and so on, or if the uh, video was such that table of content wasn't good, it's a one-time job now to, for you to come up with, uh, as you play along the video, you you just say, okay, at this point, I think there should be a change in topic. So let me add an entry here. And it automatically picks up the timestamp and so on. 
So this tool has made it fairly easy. And I myself have kind of created the table of content for loads and loads of videos. Uh, so, so now for these educational videos, uh, at least those with slides, we find we are able to uh, do a fairly good job of, of doing that indexing. And now the obvious advantage. So there are two advantages of this. One, which people don't realize initially, because often people, some of our customers say, oh, we also have an in-video search capability. I said, no, this is much more powerful than in-video search. Because to search, first you need to know what is inside the video. This is a summarization of what's there in the video. So right when you have that opaque object, this table of content and phrase cloud is giving you a very nice summary of what all are the key topics that are covered in that video, apart from then the navigational capability that you can click on an entry and it'll take you straight to that point. Or if you click on any of these phrases, it will show you all the points in the video where that phrase appears and let you jump straight to the point. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so that's one thing which we, uh, which was behind, in fact, developing that tool. We want, uh, and in fact, today, there's any video that you want to watch on Video Ken. I mean, on YouTube, you can just go to Video Ken and ask for Video Ken to first try and automatically generate. And then, if you're not happy with the quality of what we have generated, we also provide you an edit button, and you can do the editing yourself. So we want to crowdsource. What we are missing today, and this is now a topic of, uh, we have another of our new joinees uh, uh, who joined us today. Uh, so this is one of the kind of tasks that we are assigning to our people is, please come up with a nice way in which we entice, we encourage our end users to submit. Because there has to be some recognition provided to the crowds, right? To the people who would perhaps some recognition, some other value that we provide. Uh, because today it is possible, but we haven't found too many people uh, using, uh, actually submitting uh, their changes. And again, this reinforms my basic view that, and I'll start by kind of stating, I've stated in, in sometimes some of the other faculty meetings as well, that I find our biggest weakness, I mean, if I were to do a self-criticism of our effort, our biggest weakness is that we are a very heavy technology-driven kind of a company. We have not paid enough attention, and we have not been driven enough by some of the human behavioral insights. So, so we have still not cracked the nut in terms of how do you encourage the end user to come in and kind of uh, give us a lot of this uh, data, but yes, I mean, uh, today, you can uh, easily kind of edit any of this, uh, and we'll take advantage of all of that. So now this particular feature, this table of content and phrase cloud, uh, I'll take a short detour from the main topic, which is the learning platform. I'll take, just take a short detour that this has taken a life on its own. Uh, and one of the reasons it's taken a life of its own is many of our customers, when we go to Video Ken, uh, to our customers and saying, here's a learning platform that we have. Um, some of our customers tell us, look, we already have a learning platform. Uh, um, uh, then, uh, so, so we don't need an, yet another platform, but they would tell us that, oh, these video capabilities which you have, these are very nice, unique, and powerful. Is there a way for you to integrate these capabilities with our in-house learning platform? So that's one class of customers. The other class of customers that we are now targeting is what you might otherwise, what we might have thought of as our competitors. And we realize, look, we are not in the, so I'm not really in this business of uh, kind of trying to train people myself. Uh, I'm more interested in providing a platform that can be used by whoever wants to provide education skills, right, to the people. Because I think it's a huge problem. Uh, uh, certainly, we don't have the bandwidth or the scale to be able to do it uh, by ourselves, and we want to empower others who want to do it. So we're naturally going to a lot of these other learning companies. And when we go to learning companies, initially we were going to these learning companies and saying, why don't you focus on your content and whatever, some live instruction that you do and so on, leave the platform to us. But what we typically found was most learning companies have their own platform again, right? And 
they are not comfortable just saying no 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 i'll stop investing in my own platform and just rely on yours so again what we are finding is many of these companies and we have already signed a few such agreements many of these companies are uh, uh, are fine if we tell them that all you need to take from us is this video analysis and playing capability that you must be using videos for your learning and for that video component of your learning uh, do you agree that most of these videos right are not very engaging um, and having this table of content and phrase cloud will help make it uh, more engaging in the sense because what happens is now let's say you have a one hour video the learner can quickly identify those places which they are interested in just watch those portions and this becomes especially important when you are going over the same video the second time or the third time let's say we've already gone through a video so think about let's say our classroom sessions if they are getting recorded and let's say we are making those videos available to the students uh, later on now students are not going to want to watch the entire lecture all over again uh, what if on the other hand we are giving them a table of content and a phrase cloud what they would be then very open to doing and enthusiastic is uh, the specific topics that they want to go over again uh, simply go and watch those so this has taken a life of its own and it started with first an engagement that we did with acm so acm um, hopefully you all know the world's largest professional society of computer scientists acm has these webinars that are given out every few weeks there's some uh, a key researcher giving a webinar and the recordings of last 6 plus years of webinars are all there on acm site actually this site has changed now its webinars so so again we approached acm saying look these webinars are all one hour mostly one hour long and hopefully you agree right that most people will not have the patience to go through an entire one hour talk uh, why don't we index these for you right and we will simply provide uh, a yeah, so so acm basically then told us that yes as long as you can make it seamless so we made it very seamless by building our ai player so that is when we built a special uh, player which is a layer on top of the youtube player so so for this player to kick in all acm needed to do was whatever urls they are posting on their web page they simply needed to replace a few strings youtube.com with videoken.com uh, don't tell youtube they won't be happy uh, although the content remains on youtube but the url itself changes to and instead of watch something that youtube has we just have this video id once you change that automatically when somebody clicks on that url our player kicks in and now what we have done is we have now made this functionality a super set of all youtube functionality so today and again it wasn't initially uh, we had dropped a few things but now we have made it a super set of youtube functionality you get each and every feature that youtube player gives you uh, and that we are doing by simply making a call to the youtube player through api so this is again the power of this api economy uh, that we are simply calling youtube uh, for all of the youtube features and then over and above that we are giving these two features this table of contents and a phrase cloud and when you click on any of these it shows you uh, as a drop down menu kind of a thing there are the list of topics and when you click there again it takes you to that part now what we then realized is some of our customers so as we were talking to cisco they told us look in addition to learning videos uh, we also have these customer events uh, which produce a lot of videos so cisco told us that they hold something like 70 Cisco live events uh, typically in a year uh, in different parts of the world and these are all customer facing events uh, what they said is can you can you analyze some of those videos so we realized uh, that this is actually potentially much more appealing to company so so then we realized there are two kinds of videos uh, there are videos that companies consume and among the videos that the companies consume are i would say primarily two kinds so far that we've been uh, discovering one is learning videos for their employees the other is internal communication videos if there's a meeting whatever 
that meeting gets recorded and those videos are made available. Let's say all hands meeting gets recorded, those videos are available, right? So these are the videos being consumed. Now companies also produce a lot of videos and these videos could include customer events. Companies produce a lot of training videos on their products that here's our product video and uh, we need to train our customers and partners on those product videos. Uh, and then they produce a lot of marketing videos. So what we realized was that when companies produce videos, often because these, this production of videos is for revenue generating purposes. So often they are much more in some sense enthusiastic and excited about that. So we decided we should also tap into that segment. So at this point, uh, I think that page might be up. So now there's a, another page that we have set up to showcase some of these very different kinds of videos. We have been looking at, uh, uh, so we did this Cisco Live. We recently processed this Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference. So we are finding that almost every major IT company, right? They would have these major customer events where their CEO would give a talk. So Apple Worldwide Developers Conference, uh, they uh, posted the keynote, uh, recording of Tim Cook's keynote. That video was two hours, 16 minutes long. And it had 350,000 views within the first week. Within a week of Apple's posting it, uh, that two hours, 16 minute video had received 350,000 views. Similar thing, maybe a slightly smaller we saw with Microsoft. When Microsoft had its build conference recently, Satya Nadella's keynote, that keynote plus there was another talk by the Azure VP, there was a three hour, 30 minute video that Microsoft had posted on YouTube. And this video had again, tens of thousands of views. Now, what we are arguing is that most of these hundreds of thousands of viewers they are not going to have the patience to watch the entire video end to end, right? And in all likelihood, they would have missed some major portions that might have been of interest, right? That you wanted these viewers to see, but they have not because they can't go through an entire two hour plus video. Now with this table of contents, it gives you a very, very powerful way. So, I mean, uh, let's say in this Cisco live event, right? So buried in at 40th minute, in the Cisco live video was CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, talking about the Apple relationship with Cisco. Now, what we are telling people like Cisco is, look, your viewers would have missed, most of your viewers would have missed this part uh, and not gotten to hear about this because of videos being opaque. The other issue, the other thing that we are saying is, uh, so as we kind of let people watch these videos, using our table, using our player, what we call this AI player, we're able to now also track which topics are the viewers watching and at what point did the viewers leave. So, so these also become very, very powerful insights that can be shared back with these companies. So right now, so sorry about that detour, but this has become kind of also a fairly significant part of the video can business right now. We are kind of strongly trying to uh, uh, pursue this. So, I mean, as we were trying to uh, look at our second round of funding to, to stay afloat, uh, our investors showed much more interest in this than in the learning use case. So, so we had to also listen to them. Uh, and by the way, NPTEL, uh, uh, we kind of uh, uh, had a partnership with them, unfortunately kind of, uh, they didn't give us the close integration that they, we were looking for. They gave us a tab in the NPTEL. And one of the things we are realizing is most people don't even click on that tab. Uh, so, so very few, we find very few people actually being aware and using this capability. So in NPTEL, they have put a NPTEL plus tab under which they provide this functionality that you can search for any NPTEL video. And that functionality is powered by VideoCan. So you kind of, it takes you, brings you to this special page that we have set up for NVTEL. And on that page, uh, we believe we've done a better organization of NPTEL's content than NPTEL itself. Because we have, uh, we show some of the popular, most popular ever NPTEL videos, which have received, some of them have received over a million views, latest videos, and then videos by category, computer science videos, electrical engineering videos, and so on. 
uh, and of course uh, when you play these videos we are able to play them with the table of contents and the phrase cloud okay so coming back to the learning platform the other piece so i talked about the uh, overwhelming nature and the videos being opaque the other issue was of personalization that i only want to utilize the part that i need now again even both in the case of let's say educational institution or a company let's say educational institution now if you are let's say teaching this course on programming languages back to that example you you don't have a choice do i follow the mooc or do i do my own teaching uh, it need not be either of the two extremes now you can do what we allow is a combination of the two you as the instructor and we have seen that for instance with machine learning uh, machine learning having become a very very popular course we are finding many colleges are utilizing the nptel course on machine learning to teach machine learning what invariably they run into is that course is kind of it was designed with the iit students in mind and when you have a particular college using that particular course where the students who are coming in don't have the same level of background on linear algebra probability and statistics and so on some of the foundations they are finding that their students are lost when they are simply using that material uh, from the book course so so there are real reasons uh, apart from the professors kind of uh, feeling that they have to contribute there are real reasons uh, for a professor to want to not utilize a course in its entirety but just select bits and pieces and this also deals with the problem of engagement that instead of a entire one hour lecture i can now only select maybe a 10 minute clip from that one hour lecture and say hey students watch this 10 minute clip because if i tell students to watch that one hour lecture before coming to the class they won't but now you can tell students go and watch this 10 hour 10 minute clip uh, which you can select so we give these markers and you can select any arbitrary clip and say save and add to my ken list so ken means knowledge a uh, ken list is our terminology for a playlist of video clips on a given topic now the way so this ken list has many many purposes it can be used by an instructor to basically select material that they are going to use with the class or it could be used by the students directly initially we were only supporting it for instructors then we quickly realized even students ought to be given this ability to select pieces because this could be the equivalent of their notes that there's a lot of video material that they are going through and then they select okay here are the clips that i want to watch before my exam so they can select uh, the same thing we are now pro uh, we are promoting this in the companies as a powerful way to support self learning and peer to peer learning bite size learning we say look your employees may not have time to enroll in an entire course Uh, so traditionally learning companies have been providing these courses uh, uh, to various companies saying here's the course material right you can have your employees register for these courses go through that training what we are saying is you need not only rely on courses because often there's a need for employees to on a continuous basis keep learning today they have 10 minutes tomorrow or later in the week they have another 15 minutes let them not have to enroll in a course let them keep learning things and this can also be very specific to their needs if i am working on a specific business problem uh, back to that infosys cto example i may not have time to enroll in that course but once i kind of select some material which is useful for me i can not only save it for myself i can also share it because we provide a lot of sharing capabilities you can share that can list with specific list of email ids or people in your group people enrolled in a course everybody in your organization and so on so this is a way to support uh peer to peer learning and then we do further kind of uh uh edits we support further edits to convert this video clip into learning material uh, that you can add comments you can insert questions at any arbitrary points in the video you can set bookmarks and so on and then we have other features i won't go through the rest of the details we have other things discussion forum ability to create a course so while creating a course you can use a combination of these video clips 
for PowerPoint presentations, PDF documents, uh, URLs, add assignments, quizzes, and so on, right? And create an entire course. And then we, uh, yeah, so this is where I've listed some of the additional things that you can add to a can list, bookmarks, notes, questions, and so on. And then you can create an entire course. Uh, and then we have added some gamification so that in a large company, so this we initially did uh, for Bosch, which was one of, one of our early customers, they were very keen to promote this as a kind of a game amongst various employees that let there be competition of who has completed the course first, uh, who's ahead and so on. And, and again, a lot of uh, learning platforms have added these kinds of capabilities to again uh, increase the kind of completion rates because traditionally all these learning platforms have suffered from very low completion rates that there may be in MOOCs there could be thousands of students who register for a course and at the end there might be maybe four or five percent sometimes even fewer who actually complete the course so how do you encourage greater kind of uh, uh, so we added some of these so let me quickly kind of uh, now get to the uh, some of the technical details and where we have applied again machine learning and what are some of the research problems, uh, open problems that we are dealing with uh, as we look at trying to make uh, uh, this learning uh, more effective. So, so the first one is uh, this automatic table of contents creation. Uh, what we do and for that phrase cloud, what we do is basically um, we analyze all the frames uh, in the video and apply some image processing technique. So this is where we apply basically convolutional neural networks, right? So the usual deep learning techniques. Uh, and, and I would say it was this better selection of which frames to target, which led to the significance. So that led to the most significant improvements in the quality of our table of contents. Because earlier when we used to uh, develop this table of contents uh, on, especially on NPTEL videos, we used to find the quality extremely poor because very few of those lectures were using slides. And when you have a board full of equations and so on, it would kind of pick up that as the, okay, the equivalent of slides and then not do a very good job of picking up the, the text from those equations and try to uh, uh, use those as table of contents and so on, entries. So, so we've gotten, uh, again, we've been doing that. And here I would say there's a lot of now different variations that we are able to, uh, we have run into lots and lots of videos with very different ways in which these slides appear. So one very straightforward way, it would be something like this, right? Let's say if you have the entire video frame was showing what is on the screen, then it becomes an easy problem. Often we find, so one of our customers right now is Asian Development Bank Institute. Uh, so with them, actually what happened was I was trying to sell them on a learning platform. And they said, we'll come to the learning platform later. First and foremost, they said, we produce so many videos. Uh, uh, and we put them on our website. Can you provide your AI player and process all of our videos and make them available? So that's the first thing that they asked us to do. And in fact, they signed. Uh, a commercial agreement with, with us on that. As we started processing these uh, ADBI videos, we found so many variations. There are some videos where you find nice lights. There are many videos where they alternate between the speaker and the slide. Now, so now what happens is when we pick up the transition in the slide, often that is too late because I've already, I might have clicked this thing and that slide is already there and I've already started talking about it. So now we have to infer the right uh, point at which the transition happened, uh, not where in the video that uh, text started showing up. The other thing that we see a lot is many, many um, panel sessions. So ADBI had a lot of these panel sessions uh, where there are speakers at a conference. They're basically participating in a panel and different speakers are, are talking, uh, we have right now generated the table of contents by hand. And what we are now doing is, again, trying to develop automated techniques to detect what are good transition points uh, when it comes to those. 
Uh, uh, the other thing that we do is for the phrase cloud, we mostly use the audio part. Uh, we apply speech recognition, generate the transcript, and then we apply various kinds of natural language processing techniques. So again, one of our experiences from on this transcript, uh, so I was amused. So these days, uh, having processed all, all these keynotes, so now I've seen pretty much almost all recent keynotes by the major uh, computer industry leaders. I've seen Bill, uh, sorry, not Bill Gates anymore, uh, Satya Nadella's keynote, I've seen Tim Cook's keynote, uh, this guy, uh, uh, Cisco CEOs, Intel CEOs, all of that. So I was amused. Satya Nadella was talking about how the speech recognition problem has been solved. Uh, that uh, you kind of, uh, and they, he quoted this switchboard result. So these are benchmarks where uh, Microsoft beat human accuracy on that particular benchmark suite, uh, the switchboard test. So they achieved something like, I think, exceeding 96% accuracy, which was higher than what humans are able to achieve. Now, the reality that we are running into uh, that I want to just emphasize at least to the students is all of the current AI and machine learning techniques, uh, they suffer from what I, I mean, this is my own term, they suffer from a fragility problem. That these techniques work very well, often on standard benchmarks, on a specific context that you're looking at, the moment you start broadening that context, uh, things start breaking. It is true for our own solution. I mean, we have seen our table of contents. I mean, so, so we have something like at least three major conference papers. So our team at Xerox, we had a paper in ACM Multimedia, one of the top conferences. Then we had a paper in one of the educational conferences uh, uh, on next version of table of contents. More recently, so we were one of the few startups which actually had a research publication in WWW. So we had a paper in WWW conference uh, talking about our current work on table of contents. And despite having all of these papers and having, we have multiple patents. We have a few patents already issued covering this and multiple US patents pending. This is not a solved problem by any means. Table of contents, often when you throw new kinds of videos, uh, our system starts breaking down. And I've seen Similar thing happened with speech recognition. The moment you have Indian speakers, Asian speakers, and so on, the levels of accuracy of speech recognition today from the best of, I mean, you can, and we have compared Google, Microsoft, the solution from all of them, the accuracy levels are very, very low. So in fact, one of our customers, uh, in fact, engaged us to do this. Uh, uh, so this is Isha Foundation. They actually, again, signed an agreement with us and they said, can you, when they looked at Sadhguru's, all these videos, uh, they found the accuracy of the state-of-the-art engines from uh, Microsoft, Google, and so on, getting about 30% word error rate. And we were able to reduce that by doing special training. Not that we are better than, not that we have an engine which is better than Google and Microsoft. No, I'm not claiming that. But for that specific case, when we did a custom training, we were able to uh, remove, uh, reduce the error rate to about 10%. Uh, so, so we routinely run into a lot of transcript accuracy problems and also like, yeah, yes, sorry, Sridhar, you, you wanted to ask a question for a while. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good observation. Uh, it is possible, potentially, for us, so when we look at down the road audio, especially for videos where you have very little or no visual information, uh, yes, we will need to do something equivalent to what you're saying, that we will need to detect key topics, which comes from the phrase cloud kind of analysis, and then identify the phases What's the time when kind of the major topic being covered has changed from this topic to that topic? And yes, it will have to be done something kind of like an extension to the phrase cloud algorithm. Initially, what we wanted to do was whenever you have very rich visual information, we wanted to first take advantage of that. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Yeah, when there are no slides, TOC is being generated manually. So what we are claiming is that A, it is not too bad because often you can watch the video at high speed because I've often done that. I mean, play the video at one and a half or two times the speed. And as soon as, I mean, and humans are very good at figuring out, oh, I've been, I mean, at one and a half times speed, typically you can still make out what the speakers are saying. And then uh, as humans, we are very good at figuring out, oh, now the topic has changed. And one of the things that we have discovered is, so I have manually, as I've done all of this editing, I've seen there are often specific keywords that people say, now I'm going to do this. Next, I'm doing this. And often there's a pause, there's a longer pause when there's a change of topic. And often there's some way in which the speaker conveys that now I'm now moving to another topic. And you can't program all of those different ways because there are like thousand variations or at least a hundred variations in how uh, there are, there is uh, the most common that I've seen is now. Now, uh, another popular thing I've seen is next. Then I've seen one instructor who will say, what's going on? I mean, and then he would move on to this other topic. Now, you don't want to start programming all these rules that when the speaker says this, they are moving to another topic. So our goal is to first gather all this labeled data and then throw machine learning at it. Because hopefully the machine automatically learns all of these different kinds of rules itself without us having to program all these rules because those would become very rigid and, and kind of, again, very brittle. Yeah. So I think one of the challenges that we do must be that we have to do the philosophy of supervised approach of learning is that hey, I need to have the appropriate data for you to learn. Right. So, um, have you maybe one other approach you can consider? Maybe you can think about it is from an unsupervised learning perspective, augment your learning system with the domain ontology. Right. And use that as a context so that the effort that you are spending in hand creating and stable assessment probably can create an ontology for that particular thing and most of the time the at high level which ontology is fits in probably you see the identifier. Right, no that's a yeah that's a good suggestion and in fact I'll talk about some related work uh, that yes we got started in that direction of trying to build a giant concept graph and trying to uh, but then what we realized was uh, so our original goal was to improve the quality of phrase cloud by recognizing whenever there's a match against terms from the concept graph. So right now what we are seeing is just even without having any knowledge of the concept graph, now with like just these very automated techniques, we are finding we are doing a reasonably good job without having to utilize the concept graph. But yes, I mean, uh, that's definitely one of the directions we have been looking at. Yeah, so for recommendations, again, we are looking into that direction. I'll, I'll come back to that. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, okay. So uh, then uh, the other obvious extension is to build this table of contents in a hierarchical manner. Because today all we do is we do just do a one level uh, table of contents. Uh, and uh, we kind of want to allow. Uh, so again, uh, our dub 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 paper was on how to do this in a hierarchical manner, right? Where there's a certain budget that's assigned and then you try and pick up the kind of appropriate subtitles and so on, right? Within that assigned budget for that table of content entry. Uh, uh, so then further improving, yeah, so this is, this relates to Professor RC's suggestion, uh, domain-based specialization. Can you extract concepts from educational domains, documents and web resources? and prioritize those in saliency analysis, right? Kind of related to the suggestion that you just made. And we thought we would also show clusters of related concepts and so on. Uh, and I just talked about this earlier, that when we see videos without rich visual information, can we automatically identify at least the point at which there's a transition happening through a combination of things like audio pause, as well as some kind of uh, filler words and so on, except that we don't want to learn, I mean, we don't want to program these things automatically. We want these to be machine learned uh, from the 
uh, uh, label data. Uh, so back to again this particular uh, set of problems uh, of uh, that we had noted earlier with, with the use of these uh, open uh, videos. Each of these problems actually there are many more research problems um, for us to do an effective solution for each of these problems. So let me just take them one on one, one by one. So for overwhelming, another thing that we need to do is to do a ranking of videos. And uh, the other thing for personalization, you want to also do a personalized recommendation. So, so and this personalized recommendation kind of works at both stages. I mean, let's say when a high school student looks for, let's say, Bayes theorem, does a search for Bayes theorem versus a college student doing that same search, or a industry person doing a search for Bayes theorem, different results may be more appropriate, right? Depending on the background of the individual. Uh, so that's the personalization when it comes to just search. But even when they are interacting with the videos, you want to now do personalized recommendation on depending on whether they are stuck or not. So if the end user is kind of having trouble understanding the concept that they are watching the same video over and over again, going back and forth and so on, can you recommend videos covering prerequisite concepts uh, or alternate videos on that topic versus if they are kind of zipping fast through the video, can you recommend them, perhaps they are getting bored or they are already familiar with this content, can you recommend them videos on advanced concepts? So this is where we are now planning to use this notion of concept graph, uh, where we kind of build a joint concept graph with prerequisite relationships and depending on the current state of the learner, uh, do we need to recommend them videos containing prerequisite concepts or should we be recommending to them videos on the same concept or should we be re recommending videos on the follow on concept. So we feel this could be kind of a nice extension. So far most of the video recommendation work has been done on uh, kind of with these uh, collaborative filtering kind of techniques. If these people like this video, whatever, then chances are uh, based on the past history, you recommend uh, additional things to, to watch and so on. But potentially we could do this in a more learning aware manner. Another, uh, so, so let me talk about this uh, ranking of videos. So for ranking, uh, you may want to do a ranking of analysis of these videos based on both content as well as style. So already today what we do is today we often use the metadata about the videos, things like number of views, likes, comments and so on in order to figure out which are the popular videos to recommend. So this is how mostly recommendation is done today or ranking is done today. So where we are trying to take it next is by also analyzing the content and again I mean the content would mean looking at the depth and breadth of coverage of concepts. This is again another place where you could utilize this ontology uh, or the notion of concepts. But another interesting, uh, and I've already talked about user modeling to do this in a personalized manner. But another interesting uh, approach, and actually this was attempted by some of the Xerox researchers while we were still at Xerox, is analysis of style. And what was behind this uh, was that in a video lecture, it's not just the content which is important, it is also how it is delivered. Because if I talk in a monotonous voice, I am guaranteed to put you all to sleep, right? So it's not that I'm claiming I'm a very great speaker, but at least to try and hold your attention, I, any speaker who wants to hold people's attention would try and modulate voice, they would do some hand gestures, this, that, and so on. And often these kinds of lectures are more engaging than a speaker who is basically completely still and is talking in a very monotonous voice. So that same content could actually amount to a very, very bad video. So, so we try and do that automatically. So this aspect of interactivity, and in fact, it is for that reason that we have it in our platform as well as a number of learning platforms, right? Today allow you to insert questions so that when you ask students to watch these videos before the class, it's not just a case of passively watching those videos, they are also interacting with the videos, right? That after a few minutes, some question will pop up 
and they have to answer that question and you get a, a response. Yes, so, so that's a great point. Uh, and, and the other point that you have made is that teachers, right, human teachers, the good teachers are very good at kind of observing the student feedback, right, and kind of yeah, navigating, right, kind of uh, figuring out if they see a lot of puzzled looks. Uh, oh, I need to maybe explain this again, or if they are finding people are getting bored, let me speed up, right? So humans are very good at it. So how can you try and capture some of that, right? So some of that we are trying to do through that personalized recommendation that if the, the equivalent of puzzled look is if the learner is going back and forth on the same video, should we re recommend to them some videos or, or some material? on prerequisite concepts or alternate material on that same concept. So we're trying to get to some of those, or if they're fast forwarding through the material, should we recommend some more advanced material to them? So there are, these are just kind of early attempts to try and capture some of that, but yes, these are very good points. And uh, over here on this analysis of style, so one piece of work that was done where again, <coughs> our team came up with some deep learning based techniques to do, to come up with an engagement score for a video, for a video clip. So what they did was they looked at things like motion. This was looking at hand gestures of the teacher. The other thing they looked at was uh, kind of visual setup. Were there slides and I mean, was there the material uh, which was being shown? Was that very static or was that changing? Uh, uh, fairly dynamic and then sorry oops sorry press the wrong button uh, then this audio they were looking at the tone variation how much is the tone variation uh, and with that uh, uh, they did some hand labeling right I mean got some volunteers to label certain videos and so on as engaging and so on and then try to automatically infer the liveliness index of the video uh, uh, the origin, the basic goal was to be able to make these video. I mean, I automatically identify which videos are engaging, right? As as is mentioned here. So then I talked about this briefly. Again, this is both to keep the learner engaged. So one of the big issues is learners dropping out. So if the learner is let's say confused uh, with the material, they are going to likely drop out. So can you automatically a infer that this learner is having some problems going through the material and then utilize the notion of prerequisite concepts to be able to, to figure out what videos to recommend, right? Which I, I just mentioned uh, briefly that, so, so here what we are trying to do is first trying to build a giant concept graph where we identify the key, the nodes are the concepts and edges are relationship between concepts and these Relationships could be prerequisite relationships or these could be parent-child relationship that let's say something is a sub-concept of a bigger concept that you need to ultimately understand these three concepts. Let's say for machine learning, I need to understand, I need to master supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning and these are the three major components which will give me a mastery over machine learning. Uh, but then prerequisite could be something like, oh, I need to know this kind of linear algebra, uh, all of this work on statistics and so on. So, so uh, coming up with, so some of the work, so in fact, uh, one piece of research that was done by some students here was trying to come up with these uh, prerequisite relationships and hierarchical relationships of concepts. Now it turns out that to automatically infer all these relationships, that itself is non-trivial. Because what happens is, again, uh, you don't have a lot of label data on this. There are some very specific domains. Within machine learning, yes, somebody has created such an ontology. So you do have nice kind of uh, label data for that domain. But if you look at, so for instance, we created a concept dictionary of about some 53,000 concepts. And then tried to look at for how many of these concepts, right, do we understand the parent-child or prerequisite relationships, those are very, very sparse. So, so all of these are actually still, I would say, open problems. That we have made some progress, but still a lot more work needs to be done to automatically infer 
Uh, so how do you infer? You infer these based on kind of certain evidence, right? If in a course you see this topic being covered, then the next topic and so on, you kind of use that as a signal that perhaps the topics which are covered earlier were prerequisites to topics. Uh, how do you infer hierarchical relationships from the table of contents, including in the textbooks? So if you have a book with a title, then all of the entries in the table of contents, they are in some sense children. Typically you can guess or you can give some points that these are contributing to children concepts of them, them being children concepts of the overall title. And if you have a two level table of contents, then the entries at the second level are children concepts of the top level. Then the student came up with some interesting extensions that uh, can you, if you kind of from the uh, kind of entries, when you see a topic being covered in certain pages in a textbook, what are the other concepts which are being covered there? Uh, perhaps you can infer that those are whatever children concepts of this parent concept and so on. So there's a, again, a lot of work still to be done on coming up with this effective uh, pre concept graph in particular getting these, getting the nodes is the easy part, getting the edges between these nodes uh, is kind of non-trivial. Uh, so still a lot of work being done. Uh, in the interest of time, let me kind of uh, conclude with some, uh, with some interesting observations that I picked up from one of the ACM webinars that I, actually I also attended this webinar, but then we, it's also available fully indexed. There's so little that we still know about how humans, how we ourselves learn, right? So I can't claim that I have an excellent solution to support human learning uh, when I don't even understand how humans learn. Uh, so just to illustrate this point, some very fascinating work that was being done on this intersection of human learning and machine learning uh, was the seminar by Professor Tom Mitchell at CMU. What they have done is they have been asking people to read text. And while they're reading text, they have MRI scans being done of these people and they've been analyzing those scans. So it threw up some very interesting observations. One of the interesting observations it brought up was that, let's say if I'm reading a text and that text talks about there's a mobile phone and whatever, a water bottle. Uh, uh, it says that when there is a certain kind of activity that goes on in my brain when I'm reading the word, that phrase mobile phone, and that activity is different from the activity that goes on in my brain when I'm reading the word water bottle. Okay, so these are very distinct. The signatures of these are different. Now, it turns out, let's say I asked Sridhar to, Professor Sridhar to read the same text. Now, it turns out that when he's reading the words mobile phone and water bottle, again, there will be some neurons firing in his brain. It turns out that the MRI activity in his brain is very similar to the MRI activity in my brain when he's reading the same words, water bottle, and which is again different and similar to when we are both reading the word water bottle. Now furthermore, if you are reading the same text in a different language, mobile phone, let's say in Hindi, would be still be mobile phone, whatever, pani ki botal is what you are reading. Uh, in Hindi, it, he said that the kind of again MRI activity in the brain is very similar to that activity when you're reading the same word in a different language. So he said what this is pointing to is that we are coming up with visual representations, with some language independent representations of these objects. When we are reading text, we are coming up with language independent representations of these objects in our own brains. And these language repre uh, independent representations are often very consistent across humans. So the scary part is that potentially you could be training an engine to kind of see what's the MRI activity and you could, once you have access to the MRI imaging of another person, you could actually be applying this for reading the brain, for mind, mind reading. So, so there are some also scary implications of all of this kind of technology, but the, the reason I wanted to just bring that up uh, is that there's a lot for us to even learn about how humans uh, themselves learn. And another interesting 
piece that he talked about is when you're reading a, an entire story, what's going on? And he sh they showed that what seems to happen is that there are different regions of the brain that seem to take responsibility for different aspects of understanding the story. There are some regions in the brain which are primarily focusing on the syntax, some regions which are primarily focusing on the characters in the story, some uh, which are focusing on the motion and so on. So you have, uh, again, this is how the brain works. So, so the only point is, first of this slide is, first I thought this was a very interesting piece of work, so I thought let me also share something interesting that I myself learned. Uh, and B, uh, this further goes on to show that there's still so much for us to learn about how humans ourselves learn. So it's, uh, it's natural, right, that it will be a while before we get to really effective learning platforms which are able to help humans really learn. And here I've already listed some, some existing challenges which are true for our platform as well as for most platforms. That keeping learners engaged is still a huge problem for more learning platforms. Uh, a lot of learning platforms claim to do personalization, but still very effective personalization, how to automatically handle the different learning capabilities, styles, preferences of learners is still kind of an, I would say, a largely unsolved problems. Uh, a lot of learning platform work so far has dealt with the lower level layers of this Bloom's taxonomy, right, which is very popular in the world of pedagogy. Uh, remember, understand, apply, yeah, so I mean a lot of work uh, on learning platforms has traditionally address these, remember, understand these kind of layers uh, when it comes to evaluating, creating. So how do you systematically support critical thinking amongst your learners? How do you support creativity amongst your learners? Uh, yes, there are people who do this as like master instructors, but how do you support this in a almost like a almost automatic or semi-automatic manner in a learning platform, I would still say, is largely unsolved. So, so lots of uh, unsolved problems, lots of like interesting opportunities to do for the research in this area. Uh, and the other aspect that I would say is, which I made a reference earlier, that I believe a lot of this will also need to be at the intersection of human behavioral understanding and applying technology. So you need to apply technology to deal with some of these issues, how to keep the learners engaged, but first and foremost, you need to understand from a human behavioral perspective what causes that disengagement, right? And what are the behavioral techniques uh, that one could employ to keep the learners more engaged before you start throwing technology towards the problem. So let me stop here.